Welcome to this edition of Astro Chat with Jack Lazma. Our first question comes from Jason. He would like to know what's your largest concern regarding your shuttle landing at White Sands as opposed to the planned Edwards Air Force Base. Well, great question, Jason. In those days, we were landing on lake beds. I think uh, STS-3, the third space fall, uh, test flight of the space shuttle, it was uh, the last one to really uh, land on the lake bed runway. The fourth landed at the lake bed, but landed on the hard runway. So we were still using lake beds in those days because we had more runway to play with. Uh, the, one of the problems at White Sands was, of course, that we didn't have the uh, selection of different runways crossing each other. We just had a north-south runway. And the major problem was with the winds. Uh, we learned about this about a week and a half before we were going to leave town, so we had to make some quick adjustments. Uh, we uh, found that the, west, the winds from the west were very high so that we couldn't make the circling approach because it would blow us too far away. And so we had to make just a right-hand turn onto the final runway heading and uh, we had some energy problems to solve there uh, because we were coming in a little hot since we didn't have to fly that uh, circle, which would have taken a lot of energy out. But uh, the system managed to work okay. We got some good help from the ground and we were able to make that right-hand turn to the uh, south runway at White Sands without difficulty, but that was probably the major hurdle we had to overcome. Skylab was pretty big inside. If you found yourself floating motionless in the center of the Skylab workshop and unable to reach anything, could you get stuck there? Well, you know, that happens sometimes. The uh, Skylab space station was 22 feet in diameter, and sometimes you would be working uh, along one of the walls on something and not paying attention to uh, being fastened down and we'd find ourselves all of a sudden drifting away and we couldn't get back to the wall. So we could find ourselves suspended there, probably not forever, but moving very slowly, so it might have taken us two hours to get to the other side. So when that happened, we did get one of our buddies to come over and give us a boost and we continue working. And we have a question from New Jersey. Was there ever any serious discussion with Deke or others regarding your role in Apollo 20? For the uh, last three missions of the uh, lunar flights, of course, Apollo 18, 19, and 20, uh, they were all canceled because we did so well up front. But there were a number of us who were training for those three missions. Uh, although we were never officially assigned, it's clear that uh, we probably would have flown them, and instead we flew on the Skylab space station, at least about four of us did. And um, um, my, my role probably would have been as a lunar module pilot because I had a lot of experience with lunar module. I had uh, been the test and checkout pilot for uh, the first two lunar modules that came to uh, Kennedy. And then uh, I had also hundreds of hours in the lunar module simulator. I was flying helicopters. I was ex familiar with uh, traverses on the moon and all the uh, lunar science package experiments and had worked on uh, Apollo 13 uh, uh, for the uh, uh, lunar traverses on the moon, which I didn't, didn't get to do. So uh, I was headed for a lunar module seat. Richard Yurek would like to know if you had the whole lab to yourself, when you had off time, what did you like to do? In the Skylab, uh, when I had spare time, uh, which wasn't very much, uh, I think all of us preferred to look out the window because there are so many uh, things to see on the earth and we never got tired of looking out the window. Other times we'd be looking at various phenomena and, and photographing, for example, the northern and southern lights were very colorful and uh, down below us, of course, but uh, each one was a work of art, and they were all separate and different. So we got interested in looking at the, the phenomena around us uh, in the sky, but uh, mostly on the Earth, the places that we'd never been or places we'd like to visit, places we had been to before. But we can tell you that we've been in within 200 miles of most of the places on the Earth at least seven or 800 times. 200 miles high, that is. Albert Rodriguez asks, as you're part of Skylab's development, what was your general consensus on how the project would turn out even after the ill-deployed solar array? My major uh, responsibilities before uh, flying had to do with the Earth Resources uh, studies and all the equipment that we had to use and all of the sites on the ground that we had to uh, um, fly over and uh, locate and uh, take data on. So. Uh, this took uh, quite a bit of effort. I was also responsible for making sure that the simulator that we had for Skylab was uh, authentic and that it would cover the kinds of problems that we might uh, expect and uh, then we would have to of course come up with solutions for them. So, so to make sure the simulator was, uh, was realistic. Spacewalking was another one. I had uh, two spacewalks but spacewalking was another one that I trained uh, uh, 
especially for and uh, putting out the twin pole sunshade uh, before we had to go up there on short notice so it was another thing that I was responsible for training for uh, very hard. So those are the, the most um, uh, of my responsibilities and of course in the command module I was on the right side where the uh, um, lunar module pilot would normally sit and so uh, my job was mostly to uh, control and manage the uh, systems on the spacecraft we're talking about uh, propellants and communications and electrical system, the environment controls, and so so forth. Whereas the other guys were more involved in the flying and the uh, navigation. I was responsible for the systems. So we had to cross responsibilities, but all of us learned to do what the other guy had to do in case we had to substitute. So um, we were pretty well cross-trained, and um, I could have done all the scientific work, and the scientists could have done all my work as well. Paul from the United Kingdom would like to know, did you experience any sort of emotional reaction on hearing the Houston, we've had a problem message from Apollo 13? Well, Paul, I was the uh, capsule communicator on Apollo 13 when the accident occurred, and I heard them say, uh, Houston, we've got a problem. I was talking with Gene Kranz, I think, about another issue at that time. I asked him to say it again, and they said, Houston, we've got a problem. And uh, no, there wasn't any particular emotional, emotional reaction. It was uh, an emotion, it was an reaction to, to uh, solve the problem. And we had all the best people in, uh, in the space business right there in the control center to make that happen. Uh, we all worked very hard to uh, solve the problem, uh, to uh, determine what it was, and then to provide us solutions. And we didn't think about anything else. Uh, we didn't get emotional about it. We did our job. It was uh, very disciplined uh, training, I think, of all the flight controllers in the room who uh, got together to make sure that we had a solution that would work and uh, it took most of the uh, night time to uh, get them over into the lunar module, get them comfortable and safe there and uh, then you know the rest of the story. Most of the world didn't realize how close these people were to death for four days because NASA made it look easy but it was because of the hard work and the proficiency and dedication and the discipline of that whole uh, mission control team that made it happen. Tom from New York had the privilege of attending your STS-3 launch from the NASA Causeway. You made one comment and you described it as a real barn burner. What is your most vivid memory of that launch? The uh, STS-3 launch, of course, uh, took about eight and a half minutes to get, to get into orbit, so there were a lot of things you could observe and uh, I noticed that it was a heck of a ride and I uh, called it a barn burner because I thought that was descriptive. Well, I guess the most exciting part of the whole launch is right at liftoff when when everything is shaking and rattling and rolling and lurching around and getting boosted in the back and you're on your way. So that I would say is the most exciting part. But once you have gone through eight and a half minutes and the engines are cut off, you figure that you've probably escaped the most dangerous part of the mission and you get busy getting the rest of it done. Greggy would like to know, do you wish you would have stuck around NASA to fly another shuttle flight? Well, thank you for that question, Greggy. Um, uh, you correctly observed that I didn't stay around too long after the uh, STS-3 flight in March of 1982, although I stayed around for a year and a half after that, and I was working on uh, some of the uh, four, uh, forerunner designs of the International Space Station. It was called the Freedom at that time, I believe. In any case, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, fly another flight, and I was assigned to one that was a couple of years downstream. And uh, it wasn't very exciting in that it was just a satellite drop-off. It wasn't a test flight. Uh, but I got in the simulator and I realized that I had been there, done that before. I didn't realize, I feel like I was making a lot of progress uh, just getting in the simulator for the next two years. And uh, besides, it might be three or four or five years. And uh, so I decided that it was going to have to be a time when I had to go work for a living. And if this uh, didn't uh, give me the buzz that it did before, it wasn't worth the risk of myself or to my family. So uh, for that reason, I, I quit and went and did other things, but there was that opportunity.